Well, happy Easter, everybody. Uh, I know that it's early, and so I know some of you just barely crawled out of bed, and uh, maybe you're a little bit groggy, but uh, just kind of shake that off, because this is, this is the reason for our faith. We know that we celebrate uh, not just a, a holiday in the sense of what people are making it a religious holiday. We celebrate because we know that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. Easter changes absolutely everything. And uh, as we come early this morning, this is just like what happened, uh, uh, what the, the Bible tells us uh, that is recorded for us. As the woman came early in the morning to the grave because they came to uh, anoint the body of Jesus. Uh, you know, this is, this is a time for us to just really come alive. And I pray for you, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come into your homes. Thank you for uh, this Easter. Although it's different, I know it's kind of, uh, maybe some of you say, well, this is kind of weird. Well, you know what? I think weird is not the right word. I think different is, but how many of you know different is okay? Uh, uh, peculiar is okay. The Bible actually says that we are a peculiar people. We are a royal nation, and we are supposed to be the household of faith. That means uh, the Bible tells us that in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the book of Acts that they broke bread together from house to house. They had the Lord's Supper. So this morning as we break open the word, as we celebrate our faith, as we celebrate our faith, not in our faith, but we celebrate our faith in our King. We celebrate our faith in our King Jesus. Come on, let's just gather around. Come on, everybody, just let's gather around, let's sit at, at the table. We're going to uh, uh, partake of uh, Holy Communion. We're going to take of that sacrament again together as a family. And this is just, this is what it's all about, about being together as a family. And, and the reality is, is that life happens, and it happens to all of us. In life, there are disappointments. In life, there are turndowns. In life, there are things that happen to us that, that, that none of us want to happen. Uh, in life, sometimes we experience a life uh, in, a, in a hard way. And some of you may, may have experienced life like that. Some of you are maybe in a situation that you say, you know what, Henny, nothing really works out for me. You know, everybody else, you know, gets a blessing or everybody else gets blessed. But for me, all I have to deal with is disappointment. All I have, you know, every time I think I get a break. I mean, even now, I, I got a new job. And then three months later, after I got my new job here, COVID shows up. You know, now I'm without a job. Or, or maybe some of you are saying, you know what, uh, 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 you know, uh, I've been trying to work on my marriage. I've been trying to work on things. And, and now I'm at a place where, where things are just not working out. You know, my family's not even with me. I'm here alone. I'm, I'm by myself. I'm, I'm struggling in this, in this lonely place. And now I'm, I'm even isolated from other people. And, and I feel like I have to insulate myself. Hey, I've got news for you today. Everybody faces disappointments. There is not one person on this planet. The problem is with disappointments is that if you take your disappointment and you think that your disappointment is God, if you compare God to life, I want you to know today, this Easter sunrise morning, I want to introduce you to a character. I want to introduce you to somebody that, that life was really brutal with and, and, and probably in reverse, this person was brutal to life. Uh, uh, and the fact of the matter is he experienced life in a different way, but because of his failure, it brought him to a place of desperation and uh, where he found, he found something out about life that I believe all of us need to found, find, and that is he found in his desperation, in his deepest place of pain, he found that Jesus is enough. If you don't hear anything else I say, the rest of this service, I want you to remember what I just said. Jesus is enough. He has always been enough. He will always be enough. And throughout all the ages, He will be enough. Now, the person that I want to introduce you today, we, we're not very familiar with him. As a matter of fact, we don't even know his name. We don't know anything about him, more than a few verses that we read in the Gospels. And uh, we meet him when we meet him, when this character is introduced to us, we meet him in his final moments and the final moments of Jesus' life. And we can only imagine what kind of life uh, uh, has led him to this specific place. Somewhere, things went wrong for him. And it just kind of spiraled out of control to the point where he couldn't be sold as a slave. 
he did not qualify to row in the galley of the Roman boat because he could not be chained uh, uh, with other prisoners. He was, he, he was obviously what he did was so bad, so drastic, so dramatic, so horrible, so horrendous. He made so many mistakes uh, in his life and it spiraled completely out of control to the place where society said there's nothing we can do with this human being except put him to death. And the Romans that always wanted to make a spectacle of people, always wanted to remind the people their place, says, you know what, we, this guy has got no more value. The only thing we can do is crucify him. Now, he knew personally about crucifixion because everybody that was around that time knew about crucifixion. And they knew, obviously, that suicide was preferable over that way of death. He knew that for some time, it, it, uh, it, sometimes it took days for someone to die. He has seen the humiliation, the, the brutality, the, the birds feeding off human carcasses and, as they cannot fend off this birds of prey. He knew that the way that they crucified somebody uh, would really depend on the whim of the centurion, uh, uh, whether the amount, of, uh, depending on the amount of people being crucified that day. For some, they will only use ropes. For others, they would use ropes and nails. So he knew that this was, this was a horrible way to die. This was a horrible sentence. He knew that his corpse would be dragged uh, to the city dump and burned or left not in a place um, uh, uh, too far south of the city, a place called Gehenna. There was no hope for him in this life. Uh, and there was no hope for him in the life to come. And all he could hold on to for this last few moments of his life was his anger. His anger against society. His anger against maybe some of the people that he knew. His anger because of, of, of what has happened to him. And, and his anger towards these Roman soldiers. And his anger to this ultimate form of rejection. This ultimate place where society says, you have no value. There's nothing we can do but reject you. But something strange happened to him. And, and this is amazing. Something strange happened to him, and we meet him in Luke chapter, chapter 23. And if you have your Bibles, open it right now with me. Luke chapter 23, and, and you're very familiar with these verses, but I want to show you this character. And hopefully this morning, if you are facing disappointment, hopefully this morning, if you're facing rejection, hopefully this morning, if you're facing the pain of life, that I want you to know that God is greater. This Easter morning, if we can know anything, that God is greater than any pain that you can be facing. Listen to this. He's being introduced to us by Luke when he writes, Two others, both criminals. Listen to these words. Both criminal. He has no name. He's just simply called a criminal. Were let out to be executed with him. That's with Jesus. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. So we, 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 we paint the scene. We know the scene. We see that Jesus is being crucified. And on the one side of him is a criminal. On the other side of him is a criminal. And we know that Jesus is the innocent Lamb of God. And something happens in this moment. And, and Jesus is about to, 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 to do something that, that these criminals in, in all their years of probably they've seen people being crucified. Probably they've stood when others have been crucified. Probably leery about, uh, about, the, about the, Roman, the Roman society and knowing what could happen. And so they've seen this. And, and they probably heard something right now from the cross that they've never ever heard before. Listen to these words. These words coming from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Wait a minute. What did he just hear? He heard words uttered from a Roman cross that was never uttered before. The word Father. People usually call their mothers in their death. And, and if you've ever watched football, and, and you know, the first thing when they have these big burly football players, when they ask them, who do you, you, know, who you want to talk to, they, they wave. And the first thing they say is, hi, mom. That, that's, just, that's just the nature of human beings. But this criminal is hearing something that, that he's never heard. And he, and he hears this, father. Uh, 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 this is amazing, and, 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 and he kind of, he's kind of probably taken aback, and I'm taking some liberty here, but he, he knew enough about this Jewish rabbi that has been crucified with him to, to know that there was rumors anyway uh, of who this rabbi's father really was. What did he hear? Father, forgive them. He heard Jesus actually praying for others, not himself. 
this must have, this must have really taken him aback. And we read in the next verse, notice, the crowd watched and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. These rulers now, on the other hand, on the flip side of this, they felt safe. These rulers that, were, that didn't know what to do with Jesus, these rulers that were, that were planning and plotting and scheming and, and were afraid to do anything against Jesus, that's why they came to him at night. They were afraid of what the crowds might do because of Jesus' popularity. And suddenly all their fear, all their, all their resistance to say what they really wanted to say, this Jesus that, 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 that could ask them a question that they didn't know the answer for, this, this Jesus that would give them sayings that they could not figure out, this Jesus that was smarter than anything that they could propose, anything that they could say, any oppositions that they could bring out, suddenly in that moment, the, the, this, this was their moment, and, and all their, all their pent-up anger is now able to be poured out. And I know when you watch movies and, and uh, you see the, the crucifixion scenes play, play, uh, play out and it, it shows that a, a person who has been crucified is about uh, three to four feet above, the, uh, above ground and, and people are looking up at them. But I want you to know that's not the case. Romans actually crucified people six to seven inches off the ground. And the reason why they did that was because of one reason and one reason only, complete humiliation. Because it was about humiliation. It was about really the, the, the humiliation of a human being. Why? Because so that people could literally walk up to a person and almost face them face to face and scream in their faces or spit on them and walk away. And this is exactly what the Bible tells us what's going on here. Here are, these, the, here are these, le these leaders, and the people are watching this. The crowd is watching it. And you can just imagine the scene that's going on. And, and, and just as I'm trying to paint this picture with you, imagine the, the, the pressure of the moment. Imagine the crowds. Imagine people looking. Imagine some of the disciples standing there. Imagine Jesus' uh, uh, mother standing there, weeping and crying and holding it in. Imagine oh, all this. And then, and then this person hanging on the one side of Jesus. He's experiencing the same thing, and he's seeing the same thing. And watch this in verse 36. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. It says all about mockery. They called out to him, if you the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words. This is the king of the Jews. This is the sign the Jewish leaders wanted Pilate to change. He claimed, uh, 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 they said, hey, listen, uh, you know, this is, not, this is not the sign you need to put up. They told Pilate, you know, put the sign that says he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And, and, and Pilate clearly said, what I have written, I have written. Why did Pilate do that? Because Pilate wanted the message to get across to anybody. If you cross Rome, you'll end up on a cross. And we want you to know that. Now watch verse 39. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you, the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you are at it. Now, in Matthew's gospel, he said both criminals chimed in. So both of them, you know, why not? If there was a good God, if God is good, then, then none of this stuff would be happening. If you are God, aren't you supposed to do something? Now, haven't we all said that? You know, God, come on, do something. God, come on, intervene. If you're a good God, why does all this bad stuff go on in the world? If you're a good God, why do young fathers die early? If you're a good God, why do kids die? Why do parents have to bury children? If you're a good God, why all this war-torn things in the world? Why all this atrocities? Why all this, why all this pain? Why all this anguish? Why all this sorrow? If you're a good God. And these two on both sides of Jesus just kind of chimed in with everybody else saying, well, you know, honestly, if you're a good God, you know, where's God anyway in all of this? Now, the answer for us, we know the answer. The, the answer would have been, God is only a few feet to the left of you or a few feet to the right of you. That's, that's the measure of separation that you had between them and God. But then uh, Luke writes, because something strange is about to happen here. One of the criminals starts saying, well, wait a minute. I, I, I think I see something. Here is someone in the most horrible, horrible of circumstance of life. And yes, what's amazing to this man as he notices, here's a man hanging on a cross being crucified. You could barely recognize him, barely see him. And yet, he's not losing his faith. He's not cursing God. Although he's completely innocent. 
He is suffering like he is guilty. And although he is suffering unjustly, he can still see God as his father. This rabbi is drawing conclusions about God, not based on the pain and suffering that he is faced with. He knows that his father is good, even though life could be unjust. And I want you to notice, because something in that moment, something in that moment hit, hit this man. Something in that moment happened on the inside of him that needs to happen on the inside of us. Something on the inside, on that moment, something changed. In the moment where Matthew says that he was mocking and, and scourging, and in that moment, suddenly, his words changed. Suddenly, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I see something. And he saw something that no one else saw, and, and watch this. This is amazing. This transaction that's happening in the moments of, of, of the last moments of Jesus' physical life, that this is absolutely amazing. Watch in verse 40. But the other criminal protested. So one is still keeping on throwing out these animosities, these words, these, these accusations, all these things. Come on, you know, save us. Come on, Rabbi. Watch this. Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Did you hear those words? The one criminal saw something that no one else in the crowd saw, especially those mocking him. He tells the other criminal basically to shut up. That's what he said. The, the word in the Greek is a, is a real hard word. It means to warn seriously or to rebuke. Uh, and he's saying this, hey, listen, listen, dude, we deserve this. He does not. We are guilty. He is not. I see it now. He's not drawing conclusions about God based on what has happened in life or how other people treated him. And, and then, this, this for me is, is so incredible. In that moment, he's rebuking this other guy and he's saying, hey man, shut your mouth. Don't you even have a little bit of respect for God? Shut your mouth. Yes, life was hard for us. Yes, all these things. But yes, the fact of the matter, we made these choices. We are, we are on these crosses because we did something wrong. We are on these crosses because we did something, because we are guilty. But right here next to us is someone who is not guilty, and yet someone who is suffering. Someone who has done no, no wrong in his life, and yet he is suffering the most excruciating pain. And in the moment of that excruciating pain, he is still seeing his father as good as kind he is still praying to his father in the midst of the worst day of his life and then he says this and this to me this to me is beyond anything that I can imagine he looks to Jesus and he now addresses Jesus and then he said Jesus remember me Remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Ah. He speaks to Jesus. Because he realizes that the sign that Pilate had made is true. This is the king of the Jews. It is a dying man's request, a plea, really, a, a last gasp of hope. And what is amazing to me is that the last conversation with a human being before he dies, the last conversation that Jesus has with a human being before he dies is not with a good man or a holy man, but it is one of to the most hated and rejected men of society, a rejected man, an outcast man, a worthless human being in the eyes of society, an unrighteous man. Jesus has a conversation with the worst of the worst in his greatest hour of pain. And Jesus replied, oh, do I love this. I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Jesus said, my thoughts 
about you is not reflected on how everybody else sees you or what has happened to you. The way I think about you is not the way life has happened to you. The way I feel about you is not what you've done in your life. The way that my eyes are on you is not what the Romans are saying about you. It's not what society is saying about you. Society is saying you are worthless. Society is saying that you have no value. Society is saying that you are no good but to be cast out. But I want you to know that today you will be with me in paradise. This was not... This was not a prayer to Jesus for, 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 for anything. Okay, I'll change my life and hopefully things will be better. There was no hope for the future. This, there was only hope for the moment. This is incredible. I want you to know, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what people have told you, no matter what you think of church and what you don't think of church, but I want you to know something about the Jesus that was crucified on that cross more than 2,000 years ago. I want you to know something about that Jesus that shed his blood for you. I want you to know something about that Jesus that paid the highest price for you. I want you to know something about this king of the Jews, this king of humanity. I want you to know this about him. The way that he sees you is not the way you see yourself. It's not the way others see you. It's not the way life treats you. It's not the way what has happened to you. God is not your experience. God is beyond your experience. God is not what life has done to you. He's beyond what life has done to you. Because God is above life. Watch this, verse 44. By this time it was about noon and darkness fell across the old land until 3 o'clock. So we know they started this, this whole thing started at 9 o'clock in the morning. They've been, they've been together now for all this. The Bible says the light from the sun was gone and suddenly... The curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And if you've been around church and you know anything about church, you've known, you, you, you know about this. This was the man-made curtain that was between the very presence of God. And, and, and this kept, according to what they believe, kept the very presence of God away from human beings. And that is now being torn. It's being torn from the top down. That means God saying, hey, I'm ripping this veil. Then Jesus shouted, Here's the cry, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. The curtain, the veil that separated God from people is forever torn down. There it is again, those same words, Father. Father, you could, you, you, Father, you, uh, this pain, Father, I know, I, uh, Father, I know that you are there. Father, I trust you in the midst of the worst pain of life. Jesus, in the midst of all the pain, wants us to know that God is not your experience, but He can be trusted despite anything you have experienced. That God is not life, but He sent Jesus to give you true life. And look at this, verse 47. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution, oh, this is now flowing. So what had happened, watch this. He worshipped God and said, surely this man was innocent. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where you are this, this morning. I said, Pastor Henry, you're kind of emotional. Oh, I am, I am beyond emotions. My heart goes out to you. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't, know, I don't know what life has done to you, and I don't know what you've done in life. But what I do know is that it took a criminal on the cross to see what no one else saw. And all that that criminal did was say these words, remember me. Remember me. I want you to know, in this moment when you feel that you are forgotten, in a moment when you feel like giving up, and you feel like tossing in the towel, and you feel like throwing in all hope, 
You say, this is hopeless. Where is God? How can I pray? How can I pray, Father, when I'm abandoned? How can I pray, Father, when I'm in pain? How can I pray, Father, when there is nothing left? How can I pray, Father, when I feel that I've been let down? How can I pray, Father, when all of this is happening to me? I tell you how you can pray, Father, because what's happened to you has got nothing to do whether you're good or whether you're bad. That's life. Life happens to all of us. But what I do want you to know is that Jesus is is over every circumstance. Jesus rose from the dead, not only to prove who he is, but to show to you and I that our faith is in a risen Lord, in the one that has overcome death, hell, and the grave. And he's saying to you, if you will only cry out, remember me, and he'll say, I will be with you. Where is God in all of this? Right there next to you. In this moment, I want to encourage you. We're going to go to the Lord's table. And maybe maybe the sunrise service will be a different sunrise service. Maybe the sunrise service as we break bread, remembering what Jesus did for us. Remembering this man whose name we don't even know. That we will meet him. I'm looking forward to meet this man in glory one day because it's just the proof that Jesus remembered him. And if Jesus can remember a criminal on a cross, he will remember you. He will remember me. So as we come to the Lord's table, as we prepare to partake of the sacrament of the Lord, I would love to just pray with you right now, wherever you are. I would love to come in this moment in your life, however difficult it might be for you right now. I want to pray God's grace for you. Maybe maybe you're one of those people who who have walked away from God. One of those people that said, you know, uh, uh, look, look, look what life has dealt me. And if life has dealt me this, how can I have faith in a good God? I want you to know your experience is not God. Don't ever think that. Don't ever think that. In this moment, despite the pain of this life, despite the tragedy of what happens, Jesus is remembering you. Would you pray with me today? If you're in a place of disappointment, if you're in a place of giving up, if you think that, hey, man, ending my life will be the only thing that that can solve this, that's a lie. It's a lie. God gave you a life for a reason. He gave you purpose for a reason. Would you come to him so that you can find what this criminal found? Would you come to him today and find what the soldier at the cross found when it all was said and done? That truly, truly he is who he says he is. I would love to pray with you right now. and For you to invite Jesus Christ to come and wreck your world. To come and change everything. Jesus doesn't change some things. He's not an addendum that we add. He's not just something we add to our life. No, 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 no. Jesus is not a piece of the pie. He's the whole pie. Jesus must be everything. Everything. So would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads together and let's pray together. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you that I can pray, Father, Thank you what you have done for me through Jesus on the cross. Lord, I thank you that Jesus was raised from the dead. I believe that Christ has risen from the dead and that he is alive. So I pray today on this Easter of 2020, I pray and invite you into my life. I pray, Lord, that as I submit my life to you, that you would come and that you would invade every part of me. I do not withhold anything, but I give my life to you. And I pray, help me find what that criminal found. Help me find so that I would not just think, but that I would know that you remember me even in my darkest hour. Thank you for your grace. Forgive me. Give me a fresh start. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, let's go to the Lord's table. And let's partake this morning with a whole new, a whole new mindset. All of our disappointment, all of our pain. Jesus' body was broken for us. And Jesus told the disciples, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he broke the bread and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So let's partake right now of the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever part of your life is broken, Bring it to Him now in complete surrender. Let's partake in Jesus' name. In the same manner, He took the cup and said, This is the new covenant, cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup of victory. This is the cup that celebrates what God has done for us. His blood washes, cleanses us. His blood declares us brand new. We are born again because of His blood. We are saved because that innocent blood was shed for us. The criminals on the cross were saying, save us. And for, for them in their mind was, save us from this cross. But what they didn't realize, Jesus was saving them. He was saving them for all eternity. They only needed to reach out. Thank God for His blood. Let's partake now in His victory. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you today. As we celebrate Easter. I want to encourage you today as, as we've as we've come to His table so early in the morning, I want to remind you that all of life, all of life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between, all of it, God is present and God is good. And if you prayed with us for the very first time, I am so grateful. You cannot even imagine how grateful I am that you prayed this prayer with us this morning. And I want you to do something for me. Would you... Please text decided to 94,000. Decided to 94,000. Let us know about the decision that you've made. And we will come alongside of you and help you in and, and whatever way we can, even with this, even in the season of, of physical separation. We want you to know that we might be physically separated, but we are not separated ever from God or ever from the body of the Lord. Because the body of the Lord is not about buildings, it is about you. It is about others. So would you reach out to us? Would you let us know about the decision that you've made? And we'll follow up with you and pray with you. And just reminding you that God is good in the midst of all of our disappointments. What a start to this Easter of 2020. We've got a couple more services to go. We just thank you for tuning in. And you can tune in later. We'll have a different message. But we are excited about Easter. Jesus is risen from the dead. Now let him arise in your life. We love you. God bless you.